Welcome and thank you for standing by. All participants are in a listen only mode for the duration of today's session. Today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the call over to your host, Lanira Jones from the US Census Bureau. Lanira, you may begin. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lanira Jones. I'm actually from the Bureau of Economic Analysis, but thank you so much, Anthony, for the introduction. Welcome to the 2022 Executive Women in Motion event hosted today by the Bureau of Economic Analysis, the U.S. Census Bureau, the Office of Personnel Management, the Department of Education, and Federal Student Aid. We're glad to have you with us today. My name again is Lanera Jones. I'm the training officer for the Bureau of Economic Analysis, and I also serve as the advisor for our Diversity and Inclusion Council. We're so grateful that you chose to take time out of your day today to continue learning and advancing your career. A few housekeeping items as we get started. We would like to encourage you to use chat to engage and ask questions of our presenters as we move through today's program. If you have any technical questions, you're welcome to ask those in chat as well, and we will have an individual get to you um, as soon as possible to respond and help you with your issue. Today's session, as Anthony said, will be recorded. In order to turn on the WebEx closed captions, once you're in the meeting, select the CC icon closed captions at the bottom left of your screen, and closed captions will be visible to you only. The mission of Executive Women in Motion is to promote the advancement of women in the senior executive service through interagency mentoring, collaboration, and knowledge sharing. The EWIM mentoring program supports the White House priority to empower and enlist the full potential of women, men, and gender nonconforming employees in society. Full bios are in the program booklet for the speakers as we proceed through today's event. And it also includes a special note from the Department of Education Executive Champion, Ms. Quazette Crowner. Now, I'd like to introduce the U.S. Census Bureau's Director, Robert Santos, who serves as the 26th Director of the Census Bureau. Director Santos has, more than four, has a more than 40-year career in survey research and has held multiple positions in top research organizations. He has also participated in organizations throughout the statistical community, such as the American Statistical Association. I'd like to welcome Director Santos, who will provide opening remarks. Director Santos? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I assume you'll hear me and you'll shout out if you don't. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's really good to see all these familiar faces as well as familiar names listed out from the Census Bureau. But I'd also like to extend a warm welcome uh, to our guests from the Office of Personnel Management. To the Department of Education, and from our sister statistical agency, the Bureau of Economic Analysis. I'd like to start out by telling you how much I absolutely love the Executive Women in Motion program. Naturally, being uh, new to uh, the Fed system, I didn't know it existed, uh, but the mission really is amazing. Yeah, it says, and I'll repeat it because you just heard it, but it, it bears repeating. Uh, executive Women in Motion promote the advancement of women in the executives, uh, in the senior executive service through interagency mentoring, collaboration, and knowledge sharing. And I, I just cut that little piece out. Now, we all know that there aren't enough SES positions in the federal government to provide everyone their own slot. And so this program can't guarantee everyone an SES position. But to me, that just doesn't matter. What matters here is that the mission is to promote advancement of women into leadership positions. Now, most people who know me know that there are two things professionally that I'm absolutely passionate about, statistics and helping people. So any program that promotes the advancement of women to help them become better and more effective leaders, that totally resonates with me. And 
That's why I like the Executive Women in Motion program so much. Now, in each of our respective agencies and in each of our respective roles, we, we all naturally strive to be excellent. No one here wants to be mediocre, right? <laughs> we want to be at the top of our games. Um, and throughout my life experience, I found that promoting excellence occurs when we embrace equity, diversity, and inclusion in our workforce and in our everyday activities. Diverse voices and perspectives, including the voices of women and perspectives of women, encourage innovation, critical thinking, and excellence. In fact, we see this all around us if we only just take the time to look. Society benefits greatly from the leadership of women. Speaking of my own field, over the last 10 years, women have represented over half of presidents of such scientific associations as the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Statistical Association, and the American Sociological Association. In fact, this Census Bureau is proud to have two female senior staff who were elected president of the American Statistical Association. Those are Wendy Mar Martinez and Sally Keller. And of course, there are many female leaders of societal change, such as Rosa Parks, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Eleanor Roosevelt, and that could go on and on and on. Yet, despite such profound contributions to society, women's work is not always recognized or appreciated, as you know. For example, women continue to suffer a gender wage gap, one that has narrowed only slightly over the past 30 years, and it continues. This persists despite the fact that women are now more likely to have a college education than men. The wage gap for women of color is even more pronounced. And women remain extraordinarily underrepresented in political offices, boardrooms, and other leadership roles. That means we don't always have the advantage of their voices and perspectives at the highest levels. So the question we then ask ourselves is, how can we encourage women's voices and perspectives, especially in leadership? And that's where programs and events like this one come into play. Today's Executive Women in Motion is specifically focused on sharing tools and resources with employees in GS-13 through GS-15 roles so that they can successfully apply to senior executive service positions. We know that interagency mentoring, collaboration, and knowledge sharing are critical to that effort. And I appreciate today's presenters' willingness to share their experiences and expertise. I'm pleased to recognize and honor the important roles and contributions of women employees in our agency and throughout the government. And I commit to supporting their continued advancement in any way I can. The increased leadership capacity that will result from hearing your voices in our highest echelons will be a great benefit to our nation. So I say, enjoy your journey to leadership. Please remember to pay it forward and let me know how I can help you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Santos, for those wonderful remarks. Um, definitely embodies the spirit of executive women in motion and allows us to get in the mindset to be able to continue on with today's program. So I'm pleased to welcome our first keynote, Dr. Karen Orvis, the Chief Statistician of the United States. With the Office of Management and Budget's Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. In this capacity, Dr. Orvis is responsible for leading and coordinating the decentralized federal statistical system to ensure, excuse me, uh, it continues to provide the gold standard for impartial, trusted federal statistics 
foundational to informing decisions across the public and private sectors. Dr. Orvis brings 20 years of progressively broader experience spanning the federal government, academia, and private sector, where she has played leading roles in policy, program development, and evaluation, data analysis and reporting, research, outreach, and engagement. Prior to her current assignment, Dr. Orvis served in executive level roles in the U.S. Department of Defense, strategically leading multi multidisciplinary interagency teams in designing, implementing, and evaluating enterprise-wide policies and programs. Dr. Orvis will facilitate a Q&A after her remarks. So please, we welcome your questions in chat and we will get through as many as possible. Dr. Orvis? Excellent. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And just kudos to my colleague, Rob Santos, for the opening remarks as well. I really appreciate your comments, Rob. I'm going to try to share my screen and uh, well, Lanera talked a little bit about the, the 20 years of experience, which is always a little surreal to hear folks talking about your, your career while you're, you're listening in, but uh, I'm going to go through a little bit of that, that 20 years and some of the lessons learned that I had along the way. So let me see if I can share my screen for a minute and then we'll let's see here. Okay, I think I'm, I think I'm sharing here. Really an absolute pleasure to be here today, and I wish that it could be in person, but maybe there's future opportunities for that. Uh, I was asked to share a little bit about my personal career journey, uh, as well as why I was interested in joining the Senior Executive Service, and then also share some personal reflections and recommendations as you're continuing to advance on your own career journey and potentially pursue the Senior Executive Service if you're interested. So I'll talk a little bit first about my career journey. And as I mentioned, I'm gonna highlight along the way some things that personally I saw as game changers for me, as well as some areas that were huge concerns and decision points that I had along the way that you may or may not be going through similar things yourself in your career. I've been in the senior executive service now for coming up on uh, four years. I started off in the Department of Defense as a, a SES and now as the chief set of the U.S., which is housed in the Office of Management and Budget. On a personal life front, uh, I'm married and I have a seven-year-old son who's in second grade right now. So here we go. Humor me as I go through down my personal career journey a little bit. Okay, so starting off kind of early on as I was getting ready to go into uh, undergrad, into college. At the time, I didn't know what I wanted to do for certain. I was an undeclared major and I was interested in chemistry or psychology and also really liked math, so broad spectrum. But as I was taking my psychology courses, I realized that I was really drawn to industrial organizational psychology, being able to use psychology, assessments, methodological tools, and statistics to drive what we do in the workplace was really intriguing. And so I continued on that path in graduate school, getting a master's and a PhD in IO psychology. And during my time in grad school, which felt very long, if, if others can relate, but I tried many different professional experiences. I really wanted to test out what do I want to do in my career? And so I had teaching experiences from teaching my own classes to taking a semester off and actually teaching full time at a different university, uh, research oriented experiences and being an RA, uh, consulting experiences. I worked for a consulting firm for several years. And also worked uh, on basic research within the federal government as a, a contractor as part of a consortium and really enjoyed all those different experiences. Uh, for me, the ability to create new things, produce new knowledge, propel both science and practice has been really at the heart of things that I find interesting. But ultimately, I decided to uh, move into academia. And so um was looking for a research focused position and for folks that may be familiar academic job searches are no joke i think they are right up there in terms of the requirements and the hoops that you have to go through for processes to get into the senior executive service uh, but i was able to maneuver that and started as a, an assistant professor in io psychology at old dominion university down in norfolk virginia and at the time there, I was teaching and mentoring undergraduate students, master's students, and PhD students um, in IO psychology and research methods, as well as in statistics. 
and really enjoyed what I was doing and was on the route to uh, gaining successful tenure, if you will, uh, and enjoyed it very much. And I would say in particular that one on one mentoring that I had the opportunity to do both inside and outside of the classroom. But then a, a work life decision came into play. I had met who is now my husband at the time, and uh, we were indeed getting very serious. Uh, he's in the federal government. He's a civilian within the Department of Navy, and he had some great opportunities, an opportunity to come up to the D.C. area and do a year long detail. And when he came back, he really realized the D.C. area is there are a lot of opportunities, a lot of uh, different jobs that are available and promotional opportunities. And in fact, he had a pretty promotional opportunity that was up in that area. So we had a decision to make on whether we are going to to move up to the, the DC area. And we did decide to do that. And so as I was thinking about my own career, um, for folks, I'm sure you're you are familiar with academia, but in case you aren't, you don't go to a place and then find an academic job, particularly a research focused job. You find the job and you move to the place. And so uh, there were not job openings available up in the DC area at the time that we were trying to move. And so what I decided to do is kind of go back to my roots. I had was serving as a contractor, if you will, uh, during graduate school at the US Army Research Institute for Behavioral and Social Sciences, but decided to go back full time as a researcher there, focusing on basic research for the Army. And apart from me at this point was I negotiated in terms of my position, being able to bring my personal research projects that I had from ODU, including grant work that I had from the National, Re uh, National Science Foundation uh, with me and to keep doing that work. And so for me, this was a less scary career decision or choice because I felt like I was going to be able to keep up my research, keep up my CV. So if this was not the right fit for me and I wanted to pursue going back to academia, I'd still be able to do that. Um, but then a surprise came along, and this is kind of a game changer number one for my career, I would say. While I was at ARI, I was provided the opportunity for a detail assignment to go for six months to work in the office of the Secretary of Defense for uh, Department of Defense, so OSD, within a new office called the Transition to Veterans Program Office. And it was to work on a presidentially directed task force. They were redesigning the transition assistance program, which just in very brief is a very comprehensive interagency program that is provided to service members as they are transitioning from military service into civilian life. So leaving, leaving their military career and moving into post-military life and career. And there's just a whole bunch of things that that um, requires in terms of preparation and really a whole new way of life. And so they were looking for somebody, kind of why me, looking for someone that had um, assessment methodology skills, um, statistical skills, could develop a pilot evaluation plan for this program that they had developed and they wanted to test before determining whether to implement it full scale and what changes needed to be made. So this program was ultimately going to be delivered across the Department of Defense at over 200 locations and for over 200,000 service members every year. So this was exciting. It wasn't something I was planning for my career, um, but it was also scary. The timeline was super fast. This was not academic. This was not research. This was not time to think things through. It really was, um, could I bring the rigor and the evidence-based principles that I had to the assessment challenges that, that were up on the table in the aggressive timeline? And so I'd have to say this opportunity that uh, I did take and I jumped at, I uh, would never been exposed probably to this kind of work that was happening in the federal government and how meaningful it could be if I didn't have exposure from that detail. And so after the detail, I returned to the Army Research Institute and I competed for a promotion uh, for team leader and to be the basic research program manager within ARI. So it was a great leadership opportunity to, to lead a small team, still working on research, but it really had the opportunity to lead the focus and the vision for basic research uh, within the Department of Army. And then another potential opportunity came up. I learned that the office I had detailed in, the Transition to Veterans Program Office, was looking to hire a new, new director of evaluation and assessment. And this was similar, just a small little microcosm of part of the work I was working on as the detail, really covering about a bigger amount. And, you know, I think 
I was excited about this opportunity. I won't lie. I was excited that there was a GS15 potential too. I think we all kind of get excited about what might be the potential for our career. But I had some real concerns. This was probably my biggest life choice, <laughs> if you will, for my career, is I was really worried about if I make this decision, am I going to be closing key doors of my career? Am I go basically going to be saying no more research, no more academia? I'm going to take that out of my take that out of my sights and I'm going to move into more of a policy um, program using data and research to inform that, but really taking it to a more um, leadership and, and management and oversight type perspective as opposed to doing the work. And this was really tough. And I would say if you've ever found yourself in this kind of position or you do in the future, I mean, I think the first thing I would offer is there's no right or wrong and, and you're going to know yourself really what the best choice is. But the other thing, and I think also from reflection, I've really thought about this more is I think it was a fallacy for me to think about uh, that I'm closing a door and that there is not going to be an opportunity anymore if I make this choice. And so am I sure, am I sure that the path I'm going? I think in reality, my vantage point should have been, what doors am I opening? What possibilities might I have as a result of this position that I may not have had the opportunity otherwise? And it may or may not be the case that those other doors closed. So that, that's kind of a, a switch for me that I think um, I made it along the way, but it was a very difficult decision. So I did end up deciding to take this position and this really became game changer number two for me. This was a position that had huge interagency responsibilities along with strong technical responsibilities. It was interagency work happening with seven plus uh, federal agencies really in everything that was happening. Um, working with OMB, working with the Hill, senior leadership, uh, very invested in this. And also a program that really had huge impact, you know, to be able to have a department wide program that's impacting over 200,000 individuals every year was pretty cool. So I'm happy in this position. And my senior executive that was in charge of this program was in the midst of retiring. And so that we all knew the position's gonna be posted and there was some discussion there. Um, my husband at one point asked me, do you think you would consider applying for this position? And I said to him, honestly, no, <laughs> I don't think I would. Uh, at times I feel a little overwhelmed by my just smaller piece of the puzzle. So how could I possibly lead the entire mission, the entire office, the entire program. Fast forward, the SAS leader at the time asked me to step in and serve as the acting director. Um, had said that she already spoke to her senior leader and they were in agreement that I was the person that they wanted to um, serve in the interim in this role. And just as a little context, at the time there was a deputy director and there were also uh, four GS-15 directors, kind of my, my counterparts, if you will, as well. So this was not at all anything that I was anticipating. And I would say this brought up another huge concern in my career and also became a game changer. But the concern at first was beyond the thought of, oh no, I think this job is way too big and will I be able to do it? Uh, I wasn't even thinking of applying for it even when it came up for real. Uh, but the other concern was really linked to my concern about work-life balance. I was worried, you know, I had a new, new family, young son, you know, what is this going to be too much if I move into an SES level role? And this is another piece I just want to reflect on, at least from my own experiences. From acting in that role, also from my current SES roles, I would give you the answer of no. Um, in some respects, I think you actually have more flexibility for your control over your own schedule to match it with your needs more so than a potentially a GS-15 or 14 or, you know, in the GS roles positions. You're the boss, if you will. I mean, there's everybody always has a boss, but you have a lot more flexibility over your schedule to, to shift things day to day. Um, the other thing I would say is this is not a huge shift over. So if you have challenges with work like balance now, you're gonna have challenges with work-life balance as an SES. This is one of my challenge areas that I have to continuously work on, but I would say it didn't significantly shift one way or another from moving from GS um, to, to senior executive service. So ultimately for this, I decided, you know what? Yeah, I'm gonna do this. You know, I've got a senior leader that believes in me. Maybe I should believe in myself. 
And also, this is acting. So this is a chance for me to get a taste of what it would be like to have a greater scope of leadership responsibility. But if I don't like it, or if I feel like it is impacting my work-life balance way too much, you know, that's a informative information for me as well to, to help inform my future uh, career choices. But I would say I've listed this as a game changer number three for me because it really, as, as a result of going through this, and I should say that ultimately this position was reclassified as a GS-15. I think we all are aware of how SCS positions have to, they are scarce as, as Rob shared, um, although not everybody wants to go into SCS positions, so that doesn't mean that they aren't uh, attainable, uh, but moved into a GS-15 and I, I was placed permanently within the, the director of TBPO role. But this was for me, not only did it bolster my confidence and my skills to be able to have that scope of leading an entire organization and interagency effort, um, but it also made me realize, you know what, I really enjoy this and I do want to pursue this. I am interested in a senior executive service role. So that was really helpful. Um, after I was in this role for a while, though, I realized if I wanted to be competitive for an SES position, I needed to have more experiences than my TVPO experiences. Granted, I had a lot of good stories and a lot of good things I could put in my ECQs, but to show the breadth and the diversity, having different experiences really, really helps you there. And honestly, they're building your skills. So it's not just looking like you have more diversity or experiences, but you truly do. And so I was starting to look for those different opportunities and seeking out details. And I'll talk about that more in a minute on how I did that. Um, didn't happen right away for me, but ultimately a detail opportunity did come up to serve as the acting principal director um, of military community and family policy, which is a SES position that uh, would report to a deputy uh, assistant secretary of defense. Wonderful opportunity again, continue to grow my skills, new topical area. So that was really, really great. And then looking at my time to see how I'm doing. Okay. Uh, and so then moved into my, uh, I, I should also say at the time that I was doing that detail, I was starting to really ramp up, not only applying for SES positions, because I knew this is where I wanted to go, but I was having a lot of mentoring conversations, um, reaching out to a lot of folks, which I'll, I'll talk more about in a minute. And so ultimately ended up uh, being selected to be the director of the Defense Suicide Prevention Program for the DOD. So um, the basically suicide prevention programming across the, the, the entirety of DOD, across all the, the um, services. So quite a, quite a large position, but, and a new content area for me as well, I, to be honest with you. And such a meaningful position, um, very difficult, very meaningful, but it, I would say in part of, hey, why are you in your current role? You know, this is a position that the, the content is extremely intense. Uh, and the scrutiny internally and externally, uh, extremely intense. <laughs> and just to give you an example, so within my time in this, in that role, uh, I was the lead Department of Defense witness for two congressional hearings about every single year. And there were multiple Hill briefings, senior leader briefings, all the way up to the um, Deputy Secretary of Defense, as well as the Secretary of Defense. So very much, you know, about your your most pressure cooker kind of position you could have, but really rewarding. But honestly, at the, the same time, you know, as I was moving forward several years, I knew it was a point for me to continue to grow and stretch and challenge myself. And so an opportunity came about on USA Jobs, saw the US Chief uh, Statistician role and honestly read as a dream job to me. I mean, this really brought me back to the core of what I love, you know, that I have in all my roles, but really front and center, having stats, data, research, program evaluation, and using that to drive and inform decisions, um, whether that's at a federal agency level, you know, local government, state government, or individuals in their own capacity making decisions for their family. So rest is history in terms of, of where I am today. I um, want to talk a little bit about why I personally was interested in the SES. For me, Obviously, it was not about the pay or benefits, and I think that's true of all of us here. You know, we wouldn't be in federal service if that was the number one thing for us. Uh, for me, it was, and it still is, about the opportunity to lead, 
to lead individuals, teams, organizations, groups of organizations forward on a mission and being able to craft what is that mission and that strategic vision and then the plans for that implementation and really doing this from a 360 degree perspective so for, you know, for the full range of the mission. Uh, also getting to mentor and grow a team of professionals, not only to accomplish that mission, but really to grow, develop, and find satisfaction in their own careers. And you get to be a leader in terms of setting the culture and the climate for your organization. You get to lead change. You get to lead and prioritize what are the top challenges and how are we gonna solve those challenges? And likewise, what are the top opportunities and how are we gonna go after those opportunities to really propel us forward in, in whatever topic area we're talking about? So really uh, an amazing opportunity to be the, the driver in collaboration with so many others, but uh, the driver and key change for a, a topic that you may care about. Okay, so I'm gonna switch gears for a second and build on a little bit of the things that I was already sharing, um, but wanna share a few personal reflections so the, the first is, and some of these probably sound corny, but they're honestly true, and these would be my, my advice and my tips. So uh, I, I hope you find some of these useful, but be true to yourself is probably the, the, the number one key. Um, first of all, build your own brand. This is a small world of work, small connections. You know, the, it, it's, you're gonna run into people you may have never thought you'd see again, and you will. Um, so building a strong, positive reputation is critically important. And a key piece of that is relationships. I would say one of the most keys. Um, how you treat others and how you work with others is incredibly important. So not just in your team or your division or your agency, but really how do you work with everyone that you interact with? You're really creating your own legacy. And so your behaviors, your words, your attitudes toward others really matter. Um, be collaborative, make sure you're sharing credit and success, and make sure that if there is a mistake or a failure, you take responsibility for your team. Uh, you know, that's, that's our role as, as leaders, regardless of what level that you're at. Be genuine to yourself. I think the best piece of advice that really I hold uh, near and dear to me, even to this day, is when I was beginning that first SES position uh, for the Defense Suicide Prevention Office, my senior leader said to me, Karen, don't, don't act the way you think an SES should act. Be yourself. You know, it's critical, you know, you got here because of you, because of your knowledge, skills, and abilities, and your personality. Don't shift yourself into a, a mold that you think is the SES model. Um, just be, be yourself. And I think that is true for all of our positions. You know, we can get so much farther. We don't need to be this cookie cutter or this what we think um, how someone should act or be. Just be yourself. And then be vulnerable and be humble. Um, no one knows it all. No one has zero struggles or zero challenges. Uh, so just be, be willing to be vulnerable uh, when you're talking to your mentors uh, later in this program or in the future. Be be vulnerable with them, be vulnerable with peers and with your um, subordinates in particular. It will really, I think, be a beneficial thing. Okay, second one is be your own advocate. And this was some of the places I was referencing that I'd come back to. You need to be really vocal when you're looking for opportunities, whether it's detail opportunities or new assignments within your current role or new positions. Um, you need to be in the driver's seat asking for help and mentorship looking for mentors. Um, what I did is I looked up who are the people I really look up to and I asked them to have conversations with me, you know, to go to coffee, if they would do lunch, if I could stop by for 30 minutes and really just picking their brain on what's it like to be a SES to learn that, you know, and really see, hmm, why I want to do that? Let's, let's really understand it. Um, but just having that conversation and sharing what you're interested in, uh, you know, that might not only broaden your own perspective, but it might lead to other conversations. You know, I had some conversations where someone would say, you should really talk to so-and-so. They might have a good perspective for you. So I was able to use that then as, oh, so-and-so said I should talk to you. Can we get together and talk? Uh, so, so be your advocate there. I think the other thing too, for me, it was always uncomfortable to 
say that I wanted to do something different because then it implies that you're not happy where you are, you know, and you don't find meaning and fulfillment where you are. And how do you balance that? And the particular example I'll give is when I was the director of TVPO. So I'm leading an organization as a GS-15, but still knowing that I want to have other developmental opportunities and experiences to be able to grow myself. And so that's what I really focused on in those conversations is talking about my desire for continuous growth, development, and learning. It was true, but I think it also made it a safer place to talk about it um, and have those conversations with people. So I was having those transparent conversations with people. I was, I was asking for these kind of mentoring meetings and in reflection, I think that really made a big difference. Like for instance, when the detail came up for the military community and family policy role, I think folks said, hmm, maybe Karen, you know, and they may have thought about that because I had expressed interest in trying something new and getting another experience. If I wouldn't have said that to people, you know, they may honestly would have maybe not have thought of me because they would have had me in my current box, you know, working away on that important mission. So. Be your own advocate and don't be afraid to share those things. Uh, thirdly, be open, seek out and embrace various opportunities that push yourself and expand your skills. Um, first of all, don't let fear or self doubt hold you back. Uh, for me, this was a big one. And I think honestly, if I reflect back on my career and my husband jokes about this, but pretty much any major move that I've had, I'm always afraid, what if I can't do it? What if the job is too big and I don't, you know, and I, and I fail at the job? Uh, in reflection, I've never failed at any of the jobs. Doesn't mean I didn't have struggles or challenges like we all do, but believing in yourself and taking that leap, don't let you be the, the person that holds you back. Also get interdisciplinary and interagency experience. This is gonna really broaden your perspective and it's going to be a very strong asset as well for when you're developing your ECQs. So you could do that through details. You could volunteer to be a part or to lead different assignments that may have an interagency piece, even different developmental assignments. Um, many times those involve cross agency like we have here, right? So an opportunity to hear from your peers in different agencies and to, to learn and grow that way. Also seek out greater leadership responsibilities, opportunities and assignments. The SES uh, Senior Executive Service is all about leadership. So if you don't enjoy leadership, particularly the people part. Honestly, SES is probably not for you. Um, you might be better as a senior leader in SL. Um, that's a more technical focus where you're, um, you're evaluated and your focus is more on the technical piece. And those are great positions too, but really know yourself. You, the people part is a key part of the SES. And so be seeking out those leadership experiences. And regardless of where you are on your current journey, if you're a 13, a 14, a 15, or you're ready to move to SES, you know, not all those positions are created equal. So GS-15, just as an example, you know, there are supervisory and non-supervisory GS-15s. There are um, being a deputy director, a chief of staff, or even a director of an organization. So if you're interested in SES, I would encourage you to think about lateral moves too. You may still be in GS-15, you may be still in the same step, but you're building the experiences for greater leadership on your route to a, an SES position, if that's what you're interested in. Also, get as many presentations as you can under your belt. And I don't mean at conferences, but that certainly helps too. What I mean is practice briefing technical information to non-technical audiences and to senior leaders. Your ability to be able to speak to various groups and simplify your message and convey it in a non-technical way really is important to being a successful SES. And so do that practice with wherever you can, you know, be the volunteer to be the one to, to do those briefings. Um, volunteer to, you know, get that practice on how do you have a concise information that you're briefing leadership? And that can be verbally, but it could also be even how you write emails and do it in a very concise way. Um, within the Department of Defense, so I have to go back to my roots there, bluff is a very common term. Bottom line up front, that's how you should talk about everything. What are the details that someone needs to know? What's the questions they might ask that you can address beforehand so they don't have to ask the questions? And also, and probably the most importantly, what don't they need to know? Um, a key thing that I always remember, and this was um, talked about by several senior leaders, so I won't uh, name anyone in particular, but 
the, the adage is, tell me what I need to know. Don't tell me what you know. I don't need to be the technical expert and know everything. I need to know just the pieces that are important for the engagement I'm doing, the context I need to have, you know, the risks or the opportunities, but I don't need to know the whole thing. And that is incredibly difficult for folks that have a technical background, which I imagine um, many, if not the majority of you do, and, and I did as well, right? So how do we boil down to just the need to know information? Really look out for role models. So look at people that do a great job at that. Watch them carefully, take notes on what they're doing, practice. That's how you'll get stronger yourself. And mentor others. So you heard Rob Santo say that as well, but pay it forward. This is a key part of being a senior executive service member, but also along our career. Okay, find your tribe. So the tribe part is coming from, uh, folks may or may not be familiar with a book called The Tribe by Sebastian Younger, but it's really all about finding your support system helping you with work-life balance. So whether your support system is your family, it's your friends, it's your colleagues, it's your neighborhood or a community organization, but really thinking about when I have tough times at in my work, who can I rely on? Um, for me, it was very much and is very much my husband. Um, there have definitely been tough times. There have definitely been long hours and we have a great partnership where we help each other and we flex and we shift to, to make it work for our family. But you really need to find that. What's your support system to, to help you, you know, be successful and to also maintain your balance? And then finally, make sure you're engaging in self-care and maintaining your work-life balance the best you can, whatever that means for you. Um, I would say that, and I mentioned this before, but with work-life balance. If you struggle now, you're going to struggle as you continue forward probably. Um, so work on the balance now so that you have that practice and you have your techniques as you continue to uh, propel in your own career. So have, have outside of work activities and hobbies and responsibilities. Um, and I would also say, and I say this to all my team members, is try your best to not work late nights and weekends, unless you have to, because there's going to be late nights and weekends that you don't have a choice, that you just have to work it to get the mission done. So don't do that to yourself all the time or you're gonna burn out, right? So really think about, do I have to do this right now? Or is it just something I'm wanting to spend a little bit more time on to get done? Um, I fall into that trap too, but I try to catch myself so that I, I don't find myself into a place where I feel like I have, I'm pushing too far on the, on the work and, and not the life balance. And with that, I think I'll close and just highlighting, you know, I too, as Rob shared, I wasn't familiar with the Executive Women in Motions program uh, before the opportunity to speak with you today, but I wish I was. I wish I had an opportunity to be a part of this. I mean, what a critical mission and program. And diversity, from my perspective, is absolutely critical to the health and the vitality of our federal service, and particularly for the, the senior executive service as well. So you have an amazing opportunity that you're a part of right now. Uh, really take advantage of it. You know, take advantage of that mentoring, the tips and the support, and know that you now have a set of mentors. I, mean, I had a chance to look at the bios, very impressive. They're at your fingertips now. You can use them not only now, but you can reach out to talk with them in the future too. So again, just a true pleasure to be here today. And I will I think I'm turning it back over to Linera to facilitate a, a little bit of Q&A if we have time. And I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Dr. Karen, for sharing your journey with us. I do have a few questions. Here's a question. After taking the GS-15 position, did you actually have time to distance yourself from conducting research? How did you come to terms with that given your prior concerns? And do you have any regrets? Great question. Yes, I think whether I liked it or not, which I, I, I was fine with it, so bluff up front, I was fine with it, but yes, I did distance myself. It was a shift moving from the position at the Army Research Institute to then the being the Director of Evaluation and Assessment within TBPO. I, I think in some ways it was a, there was a nice surprise there because I still was 
as an example of TVPO had a strong research element, had research staff. Uh, and strong st statistical analyses that we are doing to drive evidence-based uh, policy and decisions in this program. And so while I wasn't in there, I wasn't the one doing the analyses anymore or really doing the research, I got to oversee and be a part of the vision creating with my team on what research should we be doing? You know, which research should we be con contracting out to get support from? Uh, what should be our approach in terms of analysis and, and helping the team through that? So in some ways, I got to continue that mentoring piece that I also really enjoyed from academia, um, but it was a shift. So I, I think that's a part of why it was so tough to make that initial decision of where did I want to go in my career um, and knowing that I would no longer be the doer. I wouldn't really be doing the ones you know, writing the publications either. And I don't regret it. I think the... I, I enjoyed that piece too. So, you know, I think there's different pieces in any job that you are in and pros and cons of what you really enjoy about it. But I would, would have anybody asked me five, 10 years ago, do you think you'll be the chief statistician of the United States? Yeah, I can't even imagine what my response would have been at the time, but what a wonderful career journey so far and just opportunities that have presented themselves and that I've looked for and that I've taken advantage of across the, the time. So I would just encourage that of all of you as well is don't let the fear or the unknown or what ifs hold you back from something that could be really wonderful. Okay. I have a few more questions. Um, some employees aren't sure how to maneuver around employees or possible supervisors who may not support the advancement of women. Can you please share some words of wisdom for those who may not have the full support to advance? Yeah, great question. You know, in part, I think this also, the be your own advocate and the find your tribe, you can also think about that from a mentoring perspective as well. So if, if you find that someone in your immediate chain, say your particular supervisor is not supportive, I would encourage you to, you know, look for others that you do see as role models, that you do say, see as encouraging and to have those conversations. Um, you know, this program is amazing, right? So you have at your fingertips now a whole host of mentors that are interested in doing this. I mean, they wouldn't be doing this if they weren't interested in helping mentor and develop individuals in their career. So you now have a new outlet to be able to have those conversations. Um, so that's what I would offer is don't let a single individual or a single, you know, a few individuals hold you back. Have conversations with other individuals that are more supportive. Not a question. Did the detail opportunity come to, nat to you naturally from colleagues or were you actively seeking them out? A little bit of both. So the one at the time that I was really looking for that additional opportunity prior to the SES role that I ended up securing. That was, I would say it was probably a little bit of both. I honestly think it was significantly because I had talked to a lot of people, <laughs> you know, in a, in a professional way, but that I was looking for growth and opportunities. And I was interested, I mean, I think I even shared, I'm interested in the senior executive service and I know I need to, you know, strengthen my skill set and here are the areas I think I need to work on. So I do think that's a key piece. If if folks don't out of sight, out of mind, right? So if folks don't have conversations with you or know that you have that interest, it may not be that they don't wouldn't have considered you a valuable candidate, but it just may be that you didn't come to mind because they saw you in this one role or they you're so effective and you seem so happy that they may not even think that you'd be interested in something different. So being being vulnerable to, to say that you're interested. Uh, but other ones, just one, that, that very first game changer when I went from the detail from the Army Research Institute to the Office of Secretary of Defense. No, that was, I think, just by pure, someone was looking down on me and maybe saw a path for me and helped me out because it was one of the, it was something where I think they actually wanted my supervisor to be the one to go over and, and support and they had already done a very significant detail over at OSD. So he looked at my kind of experiences. It was focused on training and that was one of my areas of expertise within uh, my, my background. And so he said, Karen, 
I think this would be good for you. So that one was not me, not me looking for it. So a little bit about. Thank you. So here's another question. Would you encourage a non-supervisory GS-14 who is seeking to enter the SES to take a GS-15 non-supervisory position if one is available? Or would you first encourage them to wait to seek a supervisory 14 or 15 to better a position themselves for SES? Hmm. I think my answer would say it kind of depends on the, the context in terms of what position you might be in right now as a GS-14, what the opportunity is for a GS-15. So I, I don't think there's a cookie cutter, oh, no, don't do that, or oh, yeah, you know, get yourself up to a 15. It doesn't matter. Uh, so I, I think you have to really look at what other skills are being built. So while, as I was stressing, one key part is the people aspect of senior executive service. There are other key aspects. So it's, you know, ma managing budget, managing IT resources. It's tackling significant, uh, moving a, a key effort change forward. It's building coalition. So how do I interact with others? So part of what you could also consider is, am I getting, you know, those other types of experience? It may not be the, the leading people in the traditional sense of supervisory, but if I'm leading, uh, a working group or a governance structure, or I have a chance to do interagency efforts in that front, then that might be a non-supervisory position might be a great option. So just kind of thinking about what am I, what am I gaining from, from this particular role and how is it going to build out my toolkit of my experiences and my skills? Okay, well, thank you. I'm now going to pass it over to Lanira. Thank you so much, Dr. Orvis. Um, really, really great insights. I think one of the takeaways that will really stick with me is that if you don't like the people aspect of management, then maybe SES isn't for you. I hadn't quite heard it in that way, but the way you said it really, really stuck. Um, so thank you so much for sharing your wonderful insights and uh, your career decisions, those pivotal moments that really help to shape where you are today. And um, just spending time with us, and we invite you to stay on for as long as you're available. And thank you so much, BB, for facilitating the Q&A. You all will see BB again shortly. Um, and now I'd like to introduce our next keynote, Lisa Indy Donaldson. She is the Chief of the Economics Measurement Division with the U.S. Census Bureau. Ms. Donaldson has spent 29 years working in the Economic Directorate and currently oversees approximately 225 staff that provide operational support to directorate programs and mission enabling services. Ms. Donaldson also serves on the Bureau's Diversity and Inclusion Council, the Enterprise Telework Group, and the Census Labor Management Council, as well as the Census Reimagined Coalition. Ms. Donaldson, we welcome you. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate the kind, kind words. Um, as Lanier mentioned, my name is Lisa Donaldson, and I first want to start by saying, Karen, phenomenal job. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. I really always enjoy when we have multiple people who speak in these forums because you start to realize it's not a cookie cutter path. It's not a one size fits all. And you'll notice there are so many themes that we have that shared experience and shared knowledge to give you that, you know, it's almost like we, we talked about our our talking points in advance, which we did not. But I wanna first start by saying, I'm truly honored and grateful to have the opportunity to address this audience. I wanna thank the organizers of this event, and I wanna give a special shout out to Stephanie Watson for her guidance and counsel. Um, these types of forums are truly important, and I wanna congratulate each of you for making the time to be here today. Um, as mentioned, I've worked at the Census Bureau since 1991 with my entire career in the Economic Directorate. Due to my husband's active duty military service, I did leave the Census for three years in 1999, and I worked in the private sector in Florida. My time at Census has consisted of two primary areas of responsibility, analysis of our economic indicator programs and business analysis and operational support of the indicator of, the, of our overall programs. My first position at Census was in monthly retail sales, and I remember being really proud of the fact 
that have played an important role in producing the retail sales estimates that were often reported on the news. I've accepted lateral assignments both as a member of the general workforce and as a branch chief before these type of movements were the norm. But I will say that as hard as I worked during my career, I was largely focused on achieving tactical goals and I really didn't take the time to attend formal leadership development programs such as these or to seek formal mentorship and advice. I do think that I've grown tremendously both personally and professionally during my career, but I'm admittedly still a work in progress. If any one person in attendance today takes even one nugget of wisdom from this discussion, I'll feel that collectively we've achieved success. I've been a member of the Senior Executive Service for nearly seven years. And over the duration of my career in professional development, like pretty much everyone joining us today, I've experienced the many facets of my organization. I was a member of the general workforce at Census for eight years before I resigned to relocate to Jacksonville, Florida for three years. Ironically, my husband received military, military orders to return to the DC area. And after thinking that the census chapter in my life had concluded, I returned to the position I left three years prior. Working in the private sector taught me a lot of things, but most importantly, I began, began to appreciate the flexibilities and opportunities that have been afforded to me as a census employee. I began to truly value my position and I began to dress, dress for the positions that I wanted rather than the one I was currently in. I approached work with a different outlook and perspective, and for the first time, I began to think my career might actually be in federal service. And I started looking for positions that would allow me to lead people and to make a difference. During my tenure at Census, I've seen a lot of change, but challenges remain to level the playing field. There are times in my career when I've worked for excellent leaders and at other points, not so much. But each interaction, even the negative ones, are a potential teaching moment. You need to really give thought to how a less than positive exchange made you feel and promise yourself that you would never do that to someone else. I often think of the quote, they may forget what you said, but they will never forget how you made them feel. As you look forward in your career, make sure that you work for individuals that you respect and who stretch you and give you opportunities for exposure. I rose to the level I'm at through hard work and also because I had leaders and champions who saw more in me than I saw in myself. Find these type of mentors and coaches. I cannot say enough about mentorship. It is a necessity. Through my personal evolution, I've realized you cannot change people. You can only change your own behavior. So learning to get, navigate your career with people who come from different perspectives and don't see the world through the same lens that you do is of the utmost importance. It is vital to build teams and to participate in teams where everyone's opinion is valued. As a woman in the senior executive service, I noted that it is critical to control my emotions, to be level-headed, and to be assertive, but not aggressive. There have been times in my career where I feel like I wasn't taken seriously or that my opinions weren't valued, and I've mentored folks who felt passed over or unheard. It's important for us to acknowledge that there are some participants here today who are dealing with silent struggles daily that their colleagues knew nothing about. I'm thinking of people of color, individuals with disabilities and hidden disabilities, LGBTQ plus colleagues, single parents and caregivers. I myself have walked the path of being a single parent. I've been a military spouse with a husband serving overseas in harm's way. And I've been, uh, my husband, I've been the primary caregiver to my, my parents when they moved into our home six years ago. I may not know your personal story, but you should know you're not alone. Many of, those, many of you listening today know what it's like to be frustrated to the point of tears and to intensely search for the light at the end of the tunnel while like seemingly ending, you know, never ending chaos and dramas around you. Every encounter and every interaction that I've had over the course of my career has prepared me for where I sit today. So please know that you don't need to lower your career aspirations or be deterred by your current struggles. You're exactly where you're supposed to be in this moment. Um, I'd like to share three things with you that I've learned along my professional journey. First, whatever is happening in your life right now at this very moment is preparing you for something greater. We are two and a half years into the pandemic and many of us are still working remotely. The pandemic continues to take a toll. Women are now significantly more burned out. I personally made the comment more than once that it feels like Groundhog Day. We wait for the day, you sit in front of the laptop, often working a longer day than you would have pre-pandemic. And you're forced to end your day by simply by children returning from school, dinners that need to be prepared, or fatigue has simply set in. 
You log off only to rest briefly before starting the same routine, routine again. Wash, rinse, repeat. Despite the added stress and exhaustion, many women are rising to the occasion as stronger leaders and taking on the extra work that comes with this. Where women are doing more to support their teams in advanced diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. For me, supporting teams and advocating for my team members is an important aspect of my leadership role. The single most important part of my job is being there for my staff. Whether it is to answer questions, provide feedback on a work deliverable, offer counsel, or to share in personal triumphs and challenges. Oftentimes my own work will, struggle, will, will suffer because I have to be there for somebody else. Um, as leaders, we absolutely need to achieve the mission of our areas. The work occurs with people, not through people. Over the years, I've spoken with many individuals who believe that doing the work is the most important aspect of their job. While being proficient in every aspect of your job is important, I would argue that it's equally or possibly even more important to learn everything that you can about how your work connects to the larger picture of organizational success. Leverage every opportunity and resource that you can to grow in your current position and bring your staff with you. Second, learn how to thrive during a successful times. Thriving during success, stressful and times, sorry, was a hard lesson for me, one that I'm still working at today. The first thing I learned was I have to be intentional about putting myself first and caring for my mind and body. I would log into work by eight, look up, and before I know it, it would be 3 p.m. I may not have eaten, moved, drank enough sweet tea, so, I mean water, <laughs> ignoring all the basic life functions that we need for us to stay healthy and balanced. I'm thankful for my mother living in my home who at 87 years young will deliver a snack or a drink when I feel unable to leave my desk. I've come to realize it's important to get into a routine that works for you in a remote environment. Be prepared to turn on the camera. People need to feel connected. I always show up and try to do everything I can to support others, supervisors, colleagues, staff, family, and this can take a toll. Yet to thrive, you must proudly care for yourself every day. You, we, we are important and are worthy of being first. In this virtual environment, I found myself struggling at times as my extrovert side was longing for interactions with my peers and my staff. When, we're in the, when we were in the office, I had tons of candy and it drew people to stop by and chat and I generally missed this. Now in a virtual space, all interactions are purposeful and oddly we're all more reachable. Being in a meeting doesn't even prevent the instant messages from appearing, but I think as Karen said, I had to coach myself to unplug from work during my off hours and weekends. And as I put this speech together on a Saturday evening, I admit, admittedly I'm still imperfect. I don't turn my work phone during off hours. I don't turn it off, but I do end each day checking my running to-do list and my schedule for the upcoming day. Closing out tasks and writing down my to-do list helps me to unwind from my day. When I entered my current position as an FES, I felt that I could have worked 24 hours a day. The questions seemed constant, the task list was never ending, and the expectations were high. I'm sure many of you can relate to this as you are embarking on your leadership journey. I had to make myself physically leave work. I had to determine what needed to be done today and what could wait until tomorrow. I remember imparting this wisdom one day as I walked past a recently promoted branch chief's office at the end of the day, saying the work will still be here tomorrow. Finish what you have to do and head home. By nature, I'm a procrastinator and I work off due dates. When one is not provided, I assign them myself as it helps me to prioritize and work to task completion. Work-life balance is so important. You can be great at your job, but it needs to be in the context of your life, not the only thing in your life. Recently, I told myself to be more present with my husband and daughter during work hours. If I can't give the appropriate attention to an issue that they text or call me about, don't half-heartedly engage. Be present. Lastly, I will share that becoming resilient is critical to thriving. Resiliency is about being proactive and doing what I can within my realm of control and keeping a positive mindset, being flexible and tapping into my social support system. The third thing I wanna share, it's important to build networks and develop relationships so that you have the connections when you or the job may require them. A lot of people that I speak with don't fully grasp the significance of networks. Many people think that years of experience in doing your job is enough to garner support in advance, but it's not what you know or who you know, but it's about who knows you. It's the personal connections that you make with others that help you to stand out. You don't have to have a huge network. Having a small and diverse network made up of high quality relationships 
with people who come from several different spheres and from all levels of your organization is more than sufficient. Your networks can enhance your careers and personal lives in a variety of ways. Meaningful relationships have helped me to work through challenging work situations easily. It's the relational aspect that makes the work itself enjoyable and has allowed me to develop really close relationships with my colleagues. Having difficult conversations are easier because you know at the end of the day, the relationship will still be there. I clearly remember feedback that I received when I was promoted into my first manage management position. Please say you're a people person and people like you. I truly believe that my ability to get along with people and to get the work done has been at the root of much of my success. Another key factor is transparency and good communication. Be real with people, be human, and meet, meet them where they are. Be vulnerable in discussions with both successes and failures because this helps to build trust. Don't hesitate to extend grace and empathy in difficult work situations as this can result in long-term positive benefits. As leaders, it is critical for us to create psychological safety for employees, allowing them to be safe to be themselves, safe to speak up, and safe to take risks and make mistakes. When you create this type of environment, you will undoubtedly reap the reward. On the flip side, perhaps the hardest lesson I've learned in this position was learning to be politically savvy. Early in my career as an entry and mid-level manager, the focus was more on achieving tactical objectives. As I advanced in my career, being strategic and being politically savvy were paramount, and it would be a true statement to say I learned some of these lessons the hard way. Throughout my career, my network has helped me to learn, have less bias in decision-making, which ultimately benefits everyone, and has helped me to achieve greater personal growth and balance. It's important to be careful so you let and influence your thinking, so aim for people in your network who model positive behaviors. You want to surround yourself with enthusiastic, authentic, and generous people. If they are, you will be too. In summary, I just want to close with the three takeaways. First, where you are in your life today is exactly where you're supposed to be. Second, put yourself first, especially in times of stress. And third, build your network with people you trust and be real so that your colleagues trust you in return. Uh, Maya Angelou, phenomenal woman, has a quote that I want to just read for all of you. Now you understand just why my head's not bowed. I don't shout or jump about or have to talk real loud. When you see me passing, it ought to make you proud. I say, it's the click of my heel, the bend of my hair, the palm of my hand, the need for my care. Because I'm a woman, phenomenally, phenomenal woman. That's me. Thank you, Lisa. We do have some questions. How do you stay motivated during challenging times? Yeah, that's a that's a great one. I am an I'm an extrovert. My motivation comes from engagement with others. My motivation comes from developing staff, being able to assist somebody. I remember maybe it was when I got my yeah, 15 promotion in the interview, I was asked my greatest accomplishment. And I actually came into the interview thinking about that and thought, it's all the people who have worked for me who are now leaders in the organization. Like, it's the legacy that you leave behind that I think is so, you know, when I walk out the census for your doors, that's what I hope is there. You know, there's little seeds of things that I've planted and knowledge I've imparted over the years. But definitely for me, it's, it's the people. It's generally the relationships that are motivating to me. Thank you, Lisa. I've got another question. Sure. When you learned the hard way, how did you rebound and remind others of your value? Yeah, so I, I, this is in reference to my comment about being politically savvy. Um, early in my career, I, I, I've always prided myself on someone who can be transparent with managing up, managing down. So information I provided to my superiors and that I provided to my staff. And I was transparent in a situation where I hadn't given a peer the benefit of the doubt. I haven't given, given that person a heads up. And I realized, wow, you know, so my, our boss came back to this individual and talked to them about something I had shared and I hadn't really given that person an opportunity to, you know, for us to engage our, our boss, not for um, me to go directly. So I, you know, humble, gracious, apologize, um, 
really learn to just not I, treat others the way you want to be treated, right? Because I wouldn't have want, we always use the phrase, my peers and I, we don't want you to be blindsided. And that's really what it amounted to. So it was a, it was a lesson where I had to learn my, the spirit of transparency, which is core to my values and how I want to lead with giving my peers that same courtesy, extending that same courtesy to them to make sure that they're in a good position. Because, you know, we all look better when we're all on the same page, right? Like our opinions can be different, but we need to understand like what's being shared. Thank you, Lisa. How do you release guilt from balancing work and life? <laughs> Excellent question. Um, you know, I hear it every day. My husband comes home from work. Oh, you're still working. My mom will come down. When are you going to stop? Or isn't it time for you to stop? You've been on there all day straight. There is there is some guilt associated with that. Um, but I think it's about really just find it's it's the priorities. That's the one thing I was trying to share. It's about finding priority, getting your priorities done, understanding what can wait, and seizing those moments. Right, like taking the opportunity. Be present for your family when your children have sporting events. Go to them, right? Like, even if it means you have to sign on later that night to finish something, like, don't sacrifice the relationships that you have with those who are most important to you for, you know, I'm not saying don't be diligent in your work, but you can you can balance it and shift things so that you can be there for all aspects. But I, guilt is a real, it, it's real, and, you know, I, I think it's been true my entire career at points. You know, there's times when we're under stress and there's times we have a lot of things going on and, you know, trying to be everything to everyone can be hard. And I think many of us, you know, I think a lot of women in the audience today, many of us have felt that. And I think we, we take that on every day. So thank you for that question. One final question. Can you clarify what you meant by being political savvy? Yeah. So being politically savvy to me is where you are looking at situations, kind of thinking at them from all angles. So you're being strategic. Like I said, you're making sure that people are not blindsided. You are uh, having open communication on issues or concerns that might affect your peer, your colleague, someone who works for you, your boss. It's about navigating all of these channels in a way um, that really just um, ensures that everybody is able to put their best foot forward. We all go through crisis, right? We all have challenges. We all have really, you know, events both personally and professionally that are going to rock us a little bit. But I think if we put a little thought into those and a little thought before you send that email, right, <clears throat> selling somebody out, before you send an email pointing the finger at somebody, you, you engage them and talk to them about it before it becomes um, something that you're, you know, that you can't turn back. So just, I mean, it really is exactly what it means. It's savvy and looking at all of your, your political strategic channels in your chain um, across the board. Thank you, and I will now hand you over back to Laneira. Thank you so much, Lisa and BB. Um, I am not sure about you all participating today, but I can definitely say I have some notes that um, I'm really excited to use as I continue my journey in the federal government, and I hope that you all are, are taking copious notes as well. As BB mentioned in the chat, if you are participating in the session on September 20th with the speed mentoring, we will, um, the questions that were not answered today, we'll take those questions and provide them to the mentors for next week's session in order for them to have an opportunity to respond to those questions. So now we're moving on to our next speaker, Mr. Shia Carter. Um, from the U.S. Department of Education's Federal Student Aid. Ms. Tricia Carter is, um, serves as the Senior Advisor to the Director of Executive Services and has been in her position for approximately three and a half years. In this role, Tricia provides daily communication and consultation 
regarding various mission critical, sensitive, and complex leadership and human resources issues. Tertia has a strong passion for human resources and has always focused on delivering world-class customer service, regardless of her position. Tertia? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Jones, thank you. I also would like to thank Director Santos for mentioning um, that we are here to share tools, resources. We're here to communicate, we're here to coordinate, and we are here to collaborate. I wanna also thank Dr. Orvis for her um, enthusiasm. She, she has actually taken over some of the slide decks. So I don't know if she actually saw the slide deck or, that, uh, or not, but thank you so much for sharing your experience. Thank you also to Ms. Donaldson for sharing your experience and just being real with everyone on the call. I wanna also thank the Census Bureau for partnering with the Department of Education for this eWIM experience. Now, before I get started, I just wanna say that I look at Good Morning America most mornings and I see George, I see Michael and I see Robin and they interview individuals and there is a conversation going back and forth. Well, guess what? That's what I want for today. There is a slide deck. There's a lot of information, but as Director Santos said today, we are here to share tools. We are here to share resources. We are here to ask questions. So take advantage of the chat. BB is going to be on it. She's going to give me those questions. And I want you to ask the questions. And guess what? If by chance I don't know, I'm sure there's somebody on this call that will know and can come up and share everything with everybody. Um, as Ms. Jones said, um, I've been in the government for 30 years. I have actually worked at OPM. I have um, that experience there. I have been at different agencies. I think it's about maybe eight or nine. So I, I have some expertise and I want to be able to share it with everyone as best I can. So we're ready. ECQs, executive core qualifications, what are they? Well, guess what? I know somebody want to ask, so guess what? I'm going to tell you. They are, and thank you for asking, um, they are leadership skills that will help you to succeed as an SES. And that is the goal for today. We want people to be successful. We want people to succeed. And again, we want to be able to share tools and resources to help everyone get there. How are they used? They are designed to assess your executive experience and determine if you have that broad executive skills that are needed to succeed. And I know Ms. Donaldson, as well as Dr. Orvis mentioned that earlier in their presentation. How are they determined? They're determined through research and, and attributes of successful executives in both the private and public sector. Next slide, please. Well, while, while the next slide is coming, do we have any questions so far? Okay. BB, is the next slide coming? Right, Ms. Carter, while BB is working on that, we do have a few questions that we can. Oh, right. over to I'm you. excited. <laughs> the first question, and always the, the question that everyone wants to know, is will the slides be shared afterwards? Yes, I do believe that um, it was mentioned that the slides will be shared um, at a later date. Um, Stephanie can um, mention anything else that I guess needs to be stated, but I do believe so, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the next question is, are there any trainings that help employees create ECQ? 
there is the Canada Development Program. And in the Canada Development Program, um, you are you will actually write your ECQs. And that's a program um, that's a 12 to 14 month program that will kind of gear you up. You'll have mentoring, you'll have classroom, classroom training, you will have um, a, a detailed opportunity. So those that um, Canada Development Program will actually assist you in writing your ECQs. Um, I'm not certain if there is a like a ECQ 101 class, but there are all we there are also um, current SESers that are available to assist you. Um, there are individuals within your agencies. Different agencies have different resources that are available for you to utilize when you decide that you want to make this step or this leap into becoming an SES. Great, lots of resources. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, I'm telling you, you have to utilize what you have. You have to utilize what you have. Well, Absolutely. thank you. This is uh, Lanira. This is Anthony. If you could give me a moment, I just want to see if I could quickly troubleshoot. Uh, BB. So, what do you have on your screen, BB? I have the power slides. Can you click the right arrow on your keyboard to see if it goes to the next slide? It is moving on my side, but it's not. Okay. You can't see it. Okay. Um, yeah. So, what you could do is stop sharing and, and reshare. You can try that. If that doesn't work. Um, if we have someone with, let's see if she can quickly do that. Uh, uh, Stephanie, you're sharing. Yes, Anthony, that's me. Tershia, give me a thumbs up if you can see this. Uh, Bibi, you want to try to go to the next slide? I you think want to try, yes. it again. Can you see it? Uh, no, Bibi, I don't see it moving. So, um, yeah, if you want to take that back, Stephanie, and try to share it, I think Bibi just. Um, Can you see it? We see your your webinar window. Um, you got to. Um, what are you trying to share? The PowerPoint slides. PowerPoint. Yeah, there you go. Uh, where's the slides on the right? All right now we see the slide. You want to try to move it forward? Okay. I. There it is. There it is. Right. Okay. So we could go back to, I think it's slide two, I believe. Okay, the next slide. Yes, thank you. Okay, welcome back. So um, we have the role of executive resources in the qualifications review board. So on the screen, you see um, the explanation of the ERB. The ERB makes recommendations to the agency, um, agency head on all SES personal actions. They review all ECQs. And depending on the size of the agency, some agencies may have multiple um, ERBs. The um, Qualifications Review Board, or the QRB, um, they're composed of three members of the SES. They uh, are from various agencies and they volunteer. So we urge all SES to participate in this awesome experience. And once you experience this um, as a QRB member, you can provide guidance um, depending on um, the uh, executive skills. You can give suggestions on the ECQs and the um, QRB. Uh, they provide an objective overview. I think that's important to mention. They provide an objective uh, review. They do not compare candidates' qualifications. Rather, they um, judge the overall scope, quality of the written ECQs that they're reviewing. Now, this brings me to a um, nice uh, example of a QRB member that we had within um, education. She was uh, one of our EWIM speakers, and Ms. Eliades provided an awesome overview of 
what a QRB does. She gave so much information that, I mean, I was taking notes. I, it was just so much. I was just so excited. And after that session, we had so many individuals to contact us to say that probably was the best session because they had no idea what a QRB was. They, they were able to get that experience. And, and Ms. Eliottis gave on point information that was that was just probably the best information that anyone probably could have heard and could have utilized if they were thinking about becoming an SES. Next slide, please. Okay, so you have various paths um, that the QRB uh, actually takes when they are dealing with the approvals. You have criterion A, which um, demonstrates uh, uh, the individual's experience. They reflect upon all of the experience to include volunteer, education, training, and any additional federal experience. This is the actual path that is most common that people actually um, follow. Then you have criterion B. This is based on the successful, successful completion of a candidate development program, which I just referenced um, a few minutes ago. Candidates complete this government-wide program and upon graduation, um, they're not guaranteed a placement in the SES um, world, but they have those um, ECQs that are ready to, ready to be um, uh, shared. And, and actually, um, when they actually apply for a government position, they don't have to actually do that ECQs because, because they're already QRB certified. And then you have Criterion C. This is a possession of a special or unique quality which would include the likelihood of executive um, success and criterion C cases are rare and only appropriate um, in certain situations. So um, in my career, I've only seen probably, probably less than five of these criterion C cases. Next slide, please. Here you have a breakdown of the diversity in the SES. And we all know that diversity is, has really um, kind of kicked up within the last uh, couple of years. You have this slide uh, talks about the ethnicity and race, the gender, and the average age of, of an SES. Next slide. And this is the- oh, Here she oh. is. Yes, ma'am. Sorry to interrupt. You said you wanted a conversation and we've got some great questions yes. in the chat. Yes. So I thought I'd throw them out there for you. Um, for the SES, Candidate Development Program. Someone asked if there is a link for that class. There is not a link. What happens is different agencies actually um, have vacancy announcements for the SES CDP program. So there, normally you see the um, announcements on USA Jobs, and it gives you a, um, a, a explanation of the program. It tells you how long the program is. Um, some programs range from 12 to um, 18 months. Here recently, I've seen an agency have a part-time CDP program, which is the well first for me. So um, I would I would actually go into USA Jobs and see you know see if you see any um, SES CDP programs. And also, uh, word of mouth is is probably the best um, um, networking. Uh, opportunity that you can have. So, you know, you have colleagues at different agencies. You may want to just, you know, call one up and just ask, hey, are you, are, is your organization thinking about um, uh, actually um, doing a CDP program in the near future? And, and that would probably be the best way, but I would say USA Jobs would definitely have that information there. Thank you. And just one more before you continue. Um, okay. Do you know what is the diversity of representations required of the ERB or QRB? So um, I know just in the past few years, and I can only speak on my experience and individuals on the line um, may be able to address as well. But I know that um, in my years of experience, I've seen um, quite a diverse ERB as well as QRB. Now, when I was actually at OPM, and I'm sorry I'm dating myself when I was there um, in the room with, with the SESers, there was always, uh, it was always diverse. So you always had, um, you know, a male, a female, and, and they were diverse in, in their race. So I can say um, that that has occurred, and, and especially with some of the ERBs over the years, I've seen that there has been a diverse um, ERB. 
So um, let's throw it back out to the audience. Has anyone else um, it, it, within your particular ages, have you seen any diverse um, ERBs, QRBs within your agency? Hi, everybody. I'm just going to hop in real quick. My name is Nakia Oliver. I am the point of contact for the Executive Resources Office here at the Census Bureau. Um, and we service Census and BEA in the Office of the Undersecretary. So just to answer, to piggyback off of um, the answer that was just given, when we, well, when the, the agency conducts ERB, we are very mindful and cognizant of diversity. So we do try to um, compose and comprise, have the ERB comprised of as uh, men, women, um, as diverse as we can with ethnicity and race. So um, we, we do do our due diligence in trying to make sure that we have representation of for everyone, right? Um, as well as um, different series, different kind of um, walks and experiences um, as it relates to the positions that they are reviewing. Thank you, Nakia. Anyone else? This is Lisa. I was just going to affirm that same thing. I've um, served on several ERBs and several QRBs and definitely have seen um, not only uh, racial and um, gender diversity, but also diversity and experience, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that. The QRBs you're required to, you know, you cannot review the candidate, you know, from your agency. Um, that's part of like the rules going in. So definitely just, you know, there's been technical people with more business people. There's been lawyers. So it's just been really great. I think just the perspective that people bring to it. So I absolutely um, have experienced that there's diversity of all types, I would say, and that in both uh, forms that I've participated in. Thank you. BB, do we have any more questions in the chat? Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. Well, I don't know right with OPM. I would just like to also uh, reiterate that OPM definitely believes in diversity, and we ha always have our QRBs that are diverse, but also all agencies now are in compliance, or must be in compliance, I should say, with the executive order that on diversity and so moving forward i would suspect or imagine that all qrbs will be of diverse not just male uh, female genders but encompassing all um, categories of diversity okay this one's question Do you have to be a GS-15 to get into the SDS Candidate Development Program? No, I've seen where GS-14s have been selected for a um, SDS-CDP uh, program. I've seen where some GS-13s have been accepted into the SDS-CDP programs. It is a competitive process. So, you know, you just have to make sure that you um, have your resume. Um, it, it explains, it, it you know, you have everything there where you don't have to um, imagine what you may or may not have done. And I think um, that you'll be fine, but it, it is not always a GS-15, um, no. Any other questions? I didn't hear you. Not at this time. Okay. All right, thank you. So um, this uh, SES geographical distribution gives you the picture of where SESs are within um, our United States. You have various states with the numbers and the distribution. And I think this is a very important slide because you can tell that we have SESers all across our country. And that's a great thing right now. Great. It's a great opportunity, as has been mentioned earlier. So, you know, once you uh, finish hearing the presentation, if you if you believe this is for you, I would say go for it. Next slide, please. So we have um, 
various formats for the um, ECQs. You have the traditional method that um, has the ECQs and some narrative statements. You have the um, accomplishment method, which um, very much just asks, you don't have to worry about um, the describing or, or talking about your um, ECQs, but you, rather you, you focus more on the competencies. And then you have the resume method, which kind of just you show within your resume that you have achieved some of those ECQs um, in one way or another. And the way you will, um, mo and most of the time, the vacancy announcement will let you know which method to um, follow. And normally, um, traditionally, you, you'll see the traditional method and you'll see the resume method. Next slide. Okay, so now we are getting ready to, how do I say, get ready to get into it. Leading change, leading change, e ECQ number one. So when you talk about leading change, you're talking about being able to talk about change within your organization, being able to meet organizational goals, being able to have that vision, being able to survive in a changing environment. And I remember Ms. Um, Dr. Karen mentioning this in her presentation earlier. Next slide. These are the competencies that um, are related to leading change. You have to be flexible. And, and I know Dr. Karen talked about that, being resilient, having that strategic thinking, that vision, being creative. I mean, these are all things that you need to touch upon when you're writing your ECQ pertaining to leading change. Next slide please. What should your focus be? What should you think about um, when you're thinking about describing your experience? You look, you, you discuss your vision. What did you do? What initiatives did you take? How did you deal with unexpected organizational changes? Because we all know that we're all going through changes within our organizations. Did your vision achieve any measurable results that had an impact on the organization? Do you have an organizational vision? All of these are, are things that you should think about when you're going to begin your writing of your ECQ-1. I would always say, um, make sure you have your thoughts together when you, when you sit down. And this right here, this slide will, will actually begin to have your, your memory thinking of what you should include within that ECQ. Next slide. Bibi, do we have any questions? Yes, we do. Okay. Do you have to have ECQs already to get into the SCS CDP? Or is it that for when you're applying for a SES position? So that could be twofold. When people apply for the SES CDP program, sometimes they already have a working document that they have prepared and they just kind of want to be able to perfect it. Or the SES CDP program will actually assist you in writing your ECQs. So you don't have to have anything already prepared when you apply, but some people do just to get a jump start. Any additional questions? No, not at this. Okay, all right. So these um, are some examples of leading change. You can talk about your, your insights, talk about how you deal with pressure, how you deal with leadership, talk about the vision, how you, how you, how you have shared your vision. These are just examples of how you can deal with leading change. Next slide. Okay, ECQ number two, leading people. And I know Dr. Karen talked about this one. So this one talks about your ability to lead people, being able to meet the needs of the organization, the, the vision, the goals, fostering development, being able to um, resolve conflicts. All of this is, is what um, is, is, is um, 
involved in leading people. Next slide. Here are the competencies. We all know you need conflict management because when, you, when you're dealing with people, you need some kind of conflict management. Um, leveraging diversity, this has become, um, this has increased over the past few years, being able to, to value people's differences, developing others, being able to be that, that person that your, 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 uh, maybe your employee can come to, to, to seek additional guidance, and being a team player, team building, being able to foster that commitment, yay, team, just kind of get things going. Next slide, please. What should the focus be? What should you ask yourself? How have you been able to, to lead any, any, anyone? How have you been able to lead a team through a challenge, through any type of crisis? How have you been able to motivate people? How do you deal with conflicts that arise within your team? Because I'm certain people on this line have dealt with conflicts within a team. If not, as my mother said, keep on living. So how do you deal with diversity amongst your team? How, does, how, do, how do you work all of this and, and how do you kind of get your thoughts together to put this in a form where you begin to develop this ECQ? Next slide. Karen, do we, Karen, I'm sorry. Bibi, do we have any questions? No, we do not. Okay, okay. Examples of leading people. Encourage, encourage, encourage. I, I, I just can't say that enough. Just encourage when you lead people. Um, develop and, and be able to perform and contribute to the organization, being, being able to foster your team, being able to, to commit and, and, and take pride in your team, being able to provide that trust when you're leading people. All of these things, all of these attributes should be included when you begin to write your ECQs. Next slide. Number three, this is my favorite, results driven, results driven. Being able to explain how you have, have um, been able to organize and, and meet the goals of your customers, making those decisions, being able to provide those high quality results, having that technical knowledge and being able to analyze and be able to calculate and take risk. This is, this is a big one. Next slide, please. Here are the competencies. Accountability. Hold yourself accountable. Hold because no one else hold yourself accountable. Customer service, de um, de decisiveness, entrepreneurship, problem solving, and that technical creditability. Yes, yes, yes. These are the competencies that you need to touch upon when writing your ECQs for results driven. I'm sorry, you can go to the next slide, BB. What should your focus be? Ask yourself, how do your priorities and objectives lead to any quality or quantity results? How did you address the needs of the customers and stakeholders? Think about that internally as well as externally. How did your decisions and, and actions impact results? Because I'm certain if you save your organization trillions and billions of dollars, you sure better put that down on, on your ECQs and make sure that that actually comes out when you're writing your, your ECQ uh, number three. And identify any problems and, and, and make sure you talk about what you implement, the solutions, how you resulted in improving services. Next slide. Here are the examples. Here are the examples. Um, just make sure that you spell out exactly what you've done. You need to be able to make sure that you identify any new sort resources, um, identify your success, identify the opportunities, discuss your um, your um, your solutions. Even if you had um, some issues, even if you had um, staffing issues, just make sure you put all of that in there so, so individuals can see how you actually um, provided those results. Be able to understand the principles, the requirements, and the policies related to your results-driven experience. Next slide. Um, Bibi, do we have any questions? Yes. Okay. Do employees use executive coaches? 
Yes, they do. They use executive coaches, and I'm sure there are individuals on the line that can that may want to provide additional information. But these executive coaches provide a lot of expertise, a lot of guidance to individuals that just are not sure which path they should take. Some people um, kind of um, think about how they can do things on their own, but others may need the, those executive coaches that are there to mentor them, that are there to provide additional guidance and support. Do we have anyone else that would like to provide any additional information on executive coaching? Sure, I, I can, do see I can this way. Oh. oh. Yes, Quay. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. That's what she Executive coaching, just keep in mind also, I mean, request it and see if it's available in your agency. But there are at least uh, two types of coaches when we talk about executive coaching. There is the executive coach that focuses on you, the individual, and you have an opportunity in a confidential environment to talk completely about whatever it is you need to talk about in your professional space, your career path, um, things to consider for your development. But then there's also the other type of executive coach that actually is uh, managed by the agency or the organization. So they have a little bit of a different take of how they um, not just communicate, but also manage that uh, coaching relationship. So they have in mind the organizational goals and, and uh, objectives in mind as they are coaching you towards performance success, not just individual career coaching. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Crowner. And I, if I could just add to that, um, when I got into my senior executive uh, position, I was afforded an executive coach largely focused on my um, professional career development. And it was excellent for me. Um, it was a really good, great experience. He helped me to navigate some of the political savvy situations that I talked about. And, you know, he gave me advice that was really simple, like, Think of life in terms of two buckets, like it matters and it doesn't matter. Like, and it sounds so basic, but it actually kind of helped me long term, you know, to think mm -hmm. of things just that generally, like this is something I need to hold on to and worry about, deal with, and this is something I don't. So um, it was just, it was, it was just a really great experience. Something I was a little nervous going into, but absolutely, mm -hmm. I, it was excellent outcome. Thank you, Ms. Donaldson. Anyone else? Um, there's a comment. The slide seems to be um, geared towards supervisory. Can you give some examples geared towards non-supervisory, which would be helpful? Um, as far as as far as results driven. Yes. So. When you're when you're writing your ECQs, and I, I, I can say this for any any um, any ECQ, um, you have to be able to show some supervisory experience. Um, I think um, this is something that you can work up to. So you can always start out with maybe your um, experience as a team lead, and then from a team lead, you can. If, if you had that supervisor experience, then you can kind of go from there. But um, you need to be able to show some supervisory expertise. Now, I know in the past, um, I, I've seen where individuals have started as a team lead and kind of led up to being a supervisor, but that takes um, experience over the years. So even though you may not be at that level now, you can actually start. There are different programs that you can actually, with well, I'm assuming within your agency that you can kind of um, apply to or tap into that will actually give you some of that supervisory ex experience. Now, is there anyone um, on the line that uh, has additional information that they want to share in regards to that question? So um, just to piggyback off of what was said, when you're going into or looking to develop your ECQs, you certainly want to try to highlight 
um, your supervisor, all of your experience counts, but you got to think of it in this type of frame. They're looking for individuals um, who are prepared to lead um, not just the agency, but lead, you know, the programs, mm -hmm. um, some very important, you know, they're looking for executive, you know, executive levels. So they certainly want to see your supervisory experience. So not that non-supervisory experience is not valuable. It certainly is, especially mm -hmm. if you can tie it into and display the competencies, you know, that are associated with each ECQ. But you do want to make sure that you demonstrate that you are prepared to um, help lead the organization. Thank you, Nakia. Anyone else? I would just add one additional point about just ensuring that the examples that are used are hard, hard hitting. So we have metrics, you know, that there's an impact for what what's provided. Um, and overall, I, I think this has been stated a few times, but just to reiterate, it's about the leadership accomplishments, right? It doesn't, it's not all, you know, <clears throat> I, I think one of the things I've noticed is oftentimes ECQs can read like a status report, you know, like monthly activity report. And those are the ones that really have challenges, but they need to be hard hitting and they need to show how you as a leader had influence and made a difference. Thank you, Ms. Donaldson. Someone else? Not at this time. Okay. Thank you, BB. So, um, ECQ number four, business acumen. This is the one that um, some people struggle with the most. Um, it involves the ability to manage um, the human financial and, and IT resources strategically. You can make decisions that produce high quality results. It also um, discusses the technical knowledge, analyzing problems and calculating risk. And like I said, this is the ECQ um, that I've seen that some people struggle with the most. Next slide, BB. The company's competencies um, here discusses um, financial management, human capital management, and technology management. Um, having these three uh, competencies, discussing these three competencies with the, within this ECQ is, is, is vital when you're dealing with, with writing your ECQ um, number four. What should your focus be? These are questions that, that people kind of ask themselves. So what is my experience when, when I'm dealing with a budget or different resources? Do I have that experience? How do I utilize my resources? What obstacles have I faced in, in doing this? I mean, have I been able to explain a short budget or have I been able to, will I be able to explain um, doing more with less folks? Um, what is your, your experience um, with a multi-sector workforce? How do you utilize technology or create or improve programs? These are questions that you can ask yourself when you're, when you're starting to write this ECQ. The examples, this is, some, uh, these, this is an example here, but um, I was thinking of a, a, another example dealing with cybersecurity. So I know that we all have seen um, in the news, you know, talking about cybersecurity, there's a lot going on in our government pertaining to cybersecurity, dealing with data and all that kind of good stuff. There are various tools that protect our government employees, and I'm sure that everyone has access to data and information. But knowing your organization, knowing how they support um, cybersecurity and the safety, knowing all of how this impacts your work, being able to respond to, to various breaches and um, how you limit these exposures um, is, is great information to be able to have and to be able to translate into this ECQ. Discuss how you have conducted and utilized your, your cybersecurity policies within your organization. This may help you when you're trying to um, compose this ECQ. Dealing with some financial um, uh, challenges will be able to, to kind of assist you 
with this ECQ, being able to, to explain how you've been able to manage a multi-million dollar budget with um, just maybe three or four folks. Something like this to be able to explain how you've been able to do this and be able to show how successful you've been. Anyone else have any, um, before we go on to um, ECQ5, anyone, because this is such a, a ECQ that, I, that I've seen in, in years where people struggle, does anyone else have any examples or any words of wisdom that they can offer at this time? I think I would echo your statements about this being one of the more difficult ECQs for folks to relate to. Um, you know, the advice and for a, a passing ECQ, really you need to exhibit two of the three competencies, right? The financial, the IT, the human capital management. So I think it, it, this is a challenge, I think, as you're moving up in your career, because you don't always have these opportunities. So I think thinking about some of the advice from the, our early, earlier keynote addresses is just to think about, you know, stretching yourself or lateral opportunities or something to get you some of that exposure because I do think it this this is hard for people. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard just because the experience at times is not always readily provided, you know, at, at the middle level management um, areas. So yeah, I, I just would echo it that this this is one I think people need to focus on. Thank you, uh, Lisa. Anyone else? Okay. Next slide, BB. ECQ number five, building coalitions. Oh, <laughs> yeah, right, Lisa. <laughs> So this involves the ability to, to be able to build your coalitions internally with other federal government agencies, with state and local governments, private sector, nonprofits, being able to um, discuss those, those common goals that you have um, with each other, making decisions that, that produce high quality results by, pop, by applying your knowledge and being able to calculate those risks. Next slide. The competencies, definitely partnering, and someone talked about political savvy, Lisa, I believe that was you that answered that question, and being able to influence and negotiate. These are competencies that should be um, utilized when you're discussing this um, ECQ. Next slide. What should your focus be? Talk about your networks, internal, external. How do your networks help you to achieve this goal? How did you bring groups together? And you know there were challenges that, that you actually had when you did this. How did you build your coalitions? All of these um, should be a focus when you're writing this ECQ. Next slide. Here are some examples. Um, identify your internal and external policies that have impacted the work of your organization. Um, being able to persuade others through consensus, through give and take, and we know whew, that's a big one through give and take. Yes, indeed. I'm sorry. That's a big one. Um, next slide, please. Do we have any questions, um, Bibi, before we go into the CCAR model? Yes. Can you please share one of the biggest pitfalls that you see employees fall in with their ECQs? I knew that was going to come up. So the biggest pitfall I see is that individuals pay others to write their ECQs. And, I, and I'm going to be honest, I, I'm going to be transparent best I can. Um, if that's your choice, I don't want to stop you from doing that. But let me tell you one thing. When you do that, you don't know what that person has wrote because I've seen different QRBs, the person will say, well, I don't even know anything, but this don't even make sense to me. If you're going to do that, make sure you review it. Like I said, I'm, I'm not going to, 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 to talk negative about that, but that's the thing that I've seen that really kind of hurts folks because people will write, you'll, you'll pay all this money to get someone to write your ECQs and you'll look at them and you'll say, my goodness, is this really me? So if you must do that, 
make sure you review it, make sure you do edits to it because you don't want someone to take out of context what, what you have done. Only you can tell your story. Only you can do that. So just be mindful of that and be careful with that. Anyone else have any comments? Um, Cause you know, I may have been a little harsh, but. <laughs> I've definitely uh, worked with some and reviewed some examples that were actually uh, written by someone other than the applicant. And I, I definitely appreciate that comment. I, I think it's people not writing things <clears throat> in the model that we're about to talk about, right? They don't clearly talk about their challenge. They don't give appropriate context. Um, if you think of writing something in a page, right, that you need to convey not only the challenge you had, give enough background for someone to understand the impact, talk through a little bit of your strategy and your tactics, and then get to your result, right? That's, you know, that takes a skill to do that. And I will tell you the hardest thing, the single hardest thing for me to do writing my ECQs was to make it about me. Because I am a team player. I will push my team in front of me. I don't need to be the guy. That was hard, right? And I tell people, it's almost like you feel like you're making yourself appearing that you're walking on water. It's all about you. It's I, 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 not the team. And I think that's that's hard for people, you know, I think both Dr. Karen and I talked about humility, um, being vulnerable, and that can be difficult and challenging, but that is the expectation, right? So I think this is the first, and you know, if you pursue an FBS career, this is the first in many um, instances that you're gonna have to put yourself sort of in that type of situation. So, yeah, I would say it's not really, they're not hard hitting. I mean, they're, they're not following the model. The model's there. We just reviewed the competencies, right? There, there's a playbook to do some of this, but you have to have the experience and the leadership opportunities to, you know, add in the girth at the substance, right? Mm -hmm. To make it really hit home with the reviewer, so. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so this is the model. The challenge, the context, the action, and the result. C car. Some people say C car. Some people say C C A R. However you want to say it, this is the model. This is the model that when you get when your when your ECQs get to that QRB board, they are expecting to see this model. The first, um, the first actually a challenge. So when you talk about challenge, um, I had a colleague to say, Tertia, challenge sounds so negative. I said, but guess what? You can turn that thing around. Once you discuss it, you can turn it around and show in your ECQ where you have turned that negative into a positive. It can happen. I've seen it. But so, so some people may think of it as a negative, but like I said, once you start writing your, 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 your C car model with, with, with your ECQs, you can turn that into a positive. When you talk about this model, it focuses on the leadership skills, which we discussed earlier, that's needed to manage these programs, these processes, these people. Um, you provide a complete picture. You know, you look about, you look at the roles, you look at you, you look at the, the applicant's leadership competencies. You focus on the candidate's accomplishments and not the organization. And when you when you start to write your ECQ within this, this C car model, you use two examples per ECQ. And normally you use two different examples. So when you sit down and start thinking, you have to make sure that you have your list of examples that will that you will be able to apply to each um, ECQ. Next slide, please. Here it is, the C car model. Um, that challenge you describe, you describe, you describe that goal, that problem, that issue um, that you are going to discuss when you're writing your ECQs. Um, the context, you talk about the individuals or the groups you work with, that environment that help you to address that challenge. The action, you discuss specific things, specific actions that you took to achieve and address that challenge. And the results, tell me what you did. 
I mean, you know, did they have an impact on the organization? Did you, were you able to save money? This writing your ECQs in this C car model should be just like you telling a story. When the QRB sits down and they read your ECQs, they should be able to say, I see the challenge. I see the context. I see the action. I see the results. Next slide, please, DB. Here are some examples. I'm not going to read them to you, but these are just, like I said, these are just some quick examples that can kind of give you a, a, a start as to how you can use the CCAR model to begin writing your ECQs. Um, there are a lot of examples out there on opm.gov, out in the SES um, um, world. So please be sure to um, you know, make, make yourself available to, to look at those because there's some excellent examples that you can you can utilize to get your give yourself a, a good start. Next slide, BB. Oh, before we go on, do we have any questions? We have one more. What makes the best ECQs stand out? Ah, let me tell you. When you write them yourself, when you write them yourself, those are the best ECQs. When you sit down and it's just you in a room, just you and a glass of water and your, your, your ink pen and your paper. Well, I'm old school. I need paper and pen, but you may want to do it on the laptop. You know, these new uh, 2022 individuals. But when you sit down, when you take the time, and when I say take the time, I don't mean... You know, you're going to spend 20 minutes, you go into the mall, then you go into the grocery store. Uh-uh. You're going to spend hours. You spend days. Some people spend weeks, months. You need to be able to carve out the time because you will not only do one revision, you will do two, three, four, five. You, you do this until you read it and you say, bam, that's it. These are the ECQs that I'm going to submit, and these are the ones that's going to get me that SES position. Those are the best ECQs when you write them yourself and you take the time and you devote the time and effort because this is a personal goal that you want to achieve. Any other questions? Okay. The, um, let's go over some reviewing and writing tips. Um, they're here. I don't think I need to read them for you, but uh, when, you're, when you're starting to write your, your ECQs, you need that, that introductory um, paragraph. You don't, you, know, you don't have to be long-winded with it because keep in mind, there is a page limit. But make sure that you give the um, individual enough information that they know just a little bit about, not a whole lot, but just, you know, just a little bit so that when they read your ECQ, they can say, okay, I understand now. I see where he, where he or she works and I'm gonna continue on with, 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 with reading. Make sure you use transitional statements because that also helps the ease in reading. Next slide. So um, I'll just pick a few. Uh, as Lisa said, use I. I know it may be difficult, you know, you want to talk about the team, but the team is not the one that is applying for this SES position. It is you, it is you, it is you. Make sure you, um, you limit your acronyms. Once you spell it out one time, that's good, but you shouldn't have um, uh, uh, DHS and, and think I'm going to know what that means because DHS could mean a whole lot could have different meanings. Um, the, the individuals that, that are reviewing your ECQ shouldn't have to guess. They And don't assume that they know because they may not. Just make sure that you, you provide that information to them. Um, make sure that you have someone else to review your ECQs. Make sure that you, you, know, you get that feedback. And don't get in your feelings when they tell you that they don't understand something because Guess what? That's a bonus for you because then you get another opportunity to regroup and revisit and make things clear. Because if 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 your neighbor doesn't understand what, what you're trying to convey, I guarantee you no one else is going to understand it. So 
take that criticism. Again, don't get in your feelings. I mean, it's okay if you do maybe just a little bit, but you know, accept that feedback, proofread it, proofread it, spell check, spell check, because I've seen um, just being in the in the room with the QRB board, I've seen when they've saw when they've seen typos. You know, it's just oh, well, this person didn't take any effort to do spell check. They were in such a rush. They handed me this, and I'm just not understanding why they didn't use spell check. So, next slide, please, BB. Okay, so now we're talking about what to avoid using the same example for more than one ECQ. And people ask, well, is it a problem? Well, it's not a problem, but you should avoid it. You when you sit down in your room with your water, think about your, your entire work experience. If you have 20 years within the government, I'm sure you have a lot of examples that you can provide. Um, don't stay away from those vague open-ended questions. Um, that, that just kind of makes things confusing where you're going to invite the, the QRB to kind of try to piece your story together. And guess what? You can only piece your story together. You can't expect for, 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 for a QRB member to piece your story together. Um, uh, be sure to um, make sure you don't use the bold and the underlining um, just just avoid that if, if at all possible. Um, Lisa, did you have something you wanted to, to say? Because I know you've been on that QRB. No? Okay. Okay. Um, so the, oh, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I thought maybe because I turned my camera on. Um, oh, yeah, I thought I mean, so too. I thought you wanted to join in. <laughs> oh, well, definitely um, do that. I mean, there, there are things that you see. Uh, and one of the things that, the same example for more than one ECQ, what always strikes me is like an interview, right? Mm -hmm. So in an interview, when someone gives the same example, when you ask different questions, and I, that's always been sort of a pet peeve of mine, it's the same thing. I think like you were saying that look at the work product, although you can't look back too far, right. technically 10 year Ten sort years. of look back to stick with, but I would encourage folks as you're moving through your career, I wasn't thinking in terms of these ECQs when I was a 13 and a 14 in the organization. Like I mentioned in my talk, I was busy just kind of working. I didn't lift my head up and say, where are leadership opportunities? But think of those big projects that you're participating in and playing a vital role in as potential examples. I mean, so, but yeah, I, the, the same example is the one that, that sticks out with me and obvious errors like the grammar sometimes on sentences that are not ended properly. So, yeah, sorry. Oh, you're fine. I told you, this is a sharing. We are sharing. Those three C's are real. Let me tell you. Yes, yes, indeed. Anyone else um, before we go to the next slide? You see anything, BB? Yes. Okay. Um, there participants are sending their appreciation and love to you and the other speakers. And also there's a question, is okay. it single or double space? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Is it single or double space when you type right enough? Um, double space, but people out there that know, um, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, it's, I believe it's double space. Um, and then there's a certain pitch and then there's a page limit as well. So, um, you know, you can't, you have to use 12 font. You can't use like 10 or nine font trying to get everything on that page because it'll be kicked back to you or to your agency. But I do believe it's um, double space if I'm, if I'm, if I'm correct. Okay, we can go to the next um, slide, BB. Okay, um, avoid. Talking about any former managers, this is not the avenue or the time for that. You leave that, um, you know, when you go out for coffee or something with some friends, this is not the opportunity for that. Um, talking about uh, your political affiliations, um, including the ECQ definition. And also, um, 
be although there's no government policy, be mindful of social media. Um, you know, be mindful of your Facebook page because I can't say that um, Miss Mister uh, Mister Smith actually went on Facebook to see if if he could find you when when he was reviewing your 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 package. I can't say that he wouldn't do that, but just be mindful of that. Be mindful of that. Um, next slide, baby. Okay. How are you going to get there? This has been discussed by um, uh, Dr. Karen, Miss um, Donaldson. Um, it has to be a personal assessment of interest. You can't have your cousin tell you, girl, you need to apply to that SES um, CDP program or that SES job because that's, that's you. That's you. It has to come from here. You have to want this because you know why? You have to work hard at this. No one else can do this work but you. Like we said, you may want to pay somebody, but I would not try that. But it has to be something that you have wanted to do. You, you heard Dr. Dr. Karen say, you know, she kind of stumbled upon it and then she decided that she liked it. So then you have to um, think about the reasons why you want to be an SES. Like I said, not because someone said, you, you know, you, you look good sitting behind a big desk with the flag and all that. No, you have to evaluate what you want. Review your experience against your ECQs. Maybe once you review your ECQs, maybe this is, this is not your season right now. Maybe you need to wait maybe another, you know, maybe year or two to get that additional experience because you may, you may not be able to portray what you want to portray through your ECQs right now. Start drafting them now. Don't wait until 11.58 when the VAX announcement closes. To, to think that you, you know, you're going to make that. Start working on them now. Even as a GS 12, 13, you can do a rough, rough draft now. Once you do your rough draft, like I said earlier, you can go to the mall. You can cut the grass. You can go visit, visit your family members. And then you come back. And I guarantee you when you come back, you're going to have a whole new draft. Because you know what? You're going to put in the in the world was this oh no that's that's not it so start now be able to to have those two strong examples you heard um miss donaldson say don't you know using that 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 ecq in ecq four and five and one after a while they'd have memorized it and they already know what you're gonna say um next slide oh i'm sorry and obtain the ses mentor that that was also mentioned earlier Okay. Um, Bibi, any questions? Time. Not at this time. Okay. We're going to move right along then. So understand your competency gaps. We, we all have them and, it, and that's okay. But just un know them and understand them and be able to work towards closing those gaps up. Be able to identify and take on projects, take on, you know, leadership um, um, competencies, take on, um, you, you may want to go on a detail to give you that additional information where you can put in your ECQs. Be able to um, um, identify jobs and, and, and issues. Be able to have all of that so you can have that information to discuss when you're talking about leading change, leading people, results driven. And as I said, look at, you know, internal or external details. I know a lot of people use those um, internal and external details for that um, business acumen, that ECQ number four, to maybe put them over the edge because they may be right there on the line, but if, if they go out and do that detail, it may be able to get them over enough where they can put that information into their ECQs in order for them to feel that they have done an excellent job. Next slide. Here you are, that proactive approach, that SES CDP program that I discussed earlier, um, you know, um, it's, it's 12 to 24 months. It's open to the world. You can look on um, the USA Jobs um, and, and most times agencies will put out there that they are recruiting now or, or they, they have that VEX announcement out there for their particular program. 
Um, you have uh, 14s, you have 15s. Like I said, over the years, I've seen 13s. So it, it all depends on how, how you have your, your resume, um, your information explained on your resume. Next slide, please, BB. Oh, we're finished. Wow, that was so fast. Okay, so this is the conclusion of the um, presentation. If you have any questions, please contact the SERS at opm.gov. We also have some um, additional resources that um, you can utilize. But just let me just say this. This is a decision that only you can make. So once you make it, please, please, please take your time, get that coach, um, you know, any other additional peers, anything that you need to do to make you successful, because you know what, this is a choice that you've made and we want everybody to be successful. Do, are there any additional questions? If I may, I just want to let everyone know that um, I'm going to drop the executive resources office, um, our email address in the chat. Um, so that if people do have questions concerning um, kind of how the executive resources office operates or ECQs or QR, whatever it may be, um, SES related matters, please feel free to reach out to us. We are um, a team of two, but we will certainly, um, you know, we welcome any questions and are here to assist. Thank you. Any additional questions, baby? So my final question is just related to what Nikita said and you. Um, are there additional resources within the federal agencies to assist employees with developing ECQs? Yes, I think that last page on the on this slide deck gives you additional resources that you can tap into to be able to um, look at the CCAR model. If you need any additional um, um, resources for um, trying to figure out how to write. And also, um, different agencies have different uh, resources. I know some agencies actually have individuals that will review your, your ECQs. Some, in, some agencies have contractors that will do that. It just depends on what your budget will allow. And the kids are their officer too. So, you know, I don't know what they do, but you know what? They'll help you in any way that they can. And um, so, so there are resources out there. You, you just have to be able to, to tap into them. I have one more question. How okay. can a GS-13 apply if the announcement limits it to just GS-14 to 15? So um, that's a good question. So um, what you can do is you can actually, you can write your, you can make sure that your resume reflects all the expertise that you have. And if you cannot apply because you're not a 14, then you will have, that will give you an opportunity to continue to put the tools in your toolkit to be able to apply when you, when you become a 14. Now I've seen some instances where it was open to the world, where a, a GS-13 was able to get in based on their expertise within their resume. But if, if it specifically says that, you know, you are, you have to be a GS-14 or 15, then my only advice to you is continue to build up your toolkit, continue to do those details, continue to do, continue to to grab um, all the experience you can. And when you become that 14, you will already have your information ready and you can apply it to the um, SDS CDP. Thank you so Thank much, Tarshia. And um, You're welcome. definitely appreciate the insight of the others that are sort of behind the scenes who've been helping to answer the questions. Lisa and Nakia, absolutely, absolutely helpful. Um, information that was shared today. So thank you so much for that insight. And now I would like to pass to uh, Jessica White, who will provide our closing remarks. Jessica. Hi. Thank you, Olenia. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, my name is Jessica White, and I am a survey statistician at the Census Bureau, as you can see from my background. Um, in the Economic Statistical Methods Division for the Data Collection Methodology and Research mm. Branch. I wanted to give a big thanks to all of our esteemed guests and a big thank you to all of you, our participants, because without you, there would be no program. 
Um, an interesting quote that I came across the other day, which I think is fitting, is one of the primary jobs of any leader is to make new leaders, Simon Sinek. Um, more women are now in government positions, influencing high level decisions and have seats at the table. I am very grateful for initiatives such as the Executive Women in Motion program to allow for even more opportunities to break that glass ceiling into the role of SES for women. I wanted to remind everyone to please complete the survey for today's EWIM session. Your feedback is on your feedback, excuse me, on the session is necessary. It will help the planning committee identify best practices and areas needing improvement. Our goal is to ensure you receive information most helpful in drafting your roadmap for career progress and success. You may find the link to the survey in the chat. Um, and I wanted to thank you all again Thank you all so very much, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. That concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may disconnect at this time.